Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, we have something special down here at Birdland this evening. A recording for Blue Note Records. When you applaud for... Guten Abend. Guten Abend. Exactly, Jefferson. Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> hey, Justin, Frank. Nice to see you all. So, tonight, Blue Note. Yeah, Blue Note. I think we all have heard about Blue Note. Only. Of the most important ones, right? Baba, Ragged, Sean, Ball, Marvel, Manfred. Guten Abend. So, what are we doing tonight? Tonight we get into one of the most iconic. Label, one of the most iconic jazz labels, and luckily we have Dave Parsons and Thomas Busk with all their knowledge and their and their fantastic records. They will guide us through this through this topic. Um, Thomas, is it true when I say that you have several copy of almost Every Blue Note original? <laughs> no, no, it's oh, not true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I, I try to collect both the stereo and the mono uh, mm. issue. And um, and I try to uh, upgrade whenever I have a chance. So, But I collect it for at least 30 years. So, so whenever I see a better copy, I buy it. And then I have an extra copy for sale. Yeah. Thomas, Thomas, that must mean you got some of them cheap if you were buying them for 30 years, right? Yeah. Compared, yeah, to, what I, I, compared to what they're like now, which are just insane, some of them. Yeah, at, at that time I thought they were expensive as well, but but I all, always liked the artwork, I always liked everything about the Blue Note. Um, yeah, and, and, and what's also important in this case we uh, go through your collection, we go through some of those titles. Everybody in the gallery, feel free to make suggestions to if you want to see one, if you want to listen to one. Uh, we really have good chances that Thomas has it with him and that we can listen some 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 of it. And uh, right now at the OBC shop, we have over 30 copies uh, uh, of, of Blue Note originals, second pressings. And, and we go into those little later pressings too because uh, uh, they are quite often amazing alternatives uh, when it comes to the price value of things because some of those originals are really really insane dave your take on blue note if i may ask you. what what's what's your general take on blue note well you know it's an amazing iconic jazz label and you know i like american small group jazz bebop hardbop which is what people collect you know when i when i go out to see jazz collectors you know, they all want the same sort of thing really, bro. and it's all about those hard hardbop small group records and you know i, I guess you say blue note with the the top level of that yeah. with, with you know prestige right up there as well but i think you know everybody looked at blue note uh and it, it i think it's to do not it's not just the music and the amazing artists they had but it's also the quality of the design the way it was yes. presented read yeah. miles and his graphic design yeah. the photography yeah that was used from the sessions and it was just that whole combination that made something very very special uh, which people now they want, you know. Um, yeah. and, and, and and you 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 as a collector, I know that you are 
move deep into classical, into into war, into into quite some uh, regions of, of music. How is your personal connection as a collector in music and jazz? Yeah, but I, I've always been, you know, classical and jazz have a very close connection. There's a lot of yeah. people out there. This has been the same for many, many years. Uh, you know, people in classical, they also have jazz um, and vice versa. Uh, and, you know, I got introduced to, you know, I was, by, you know, I went to see jazz artists when I was quite young. Uh, yeah. Me and my friends, we were quite into the music. Yeah, you know, we went in through sort of very traditional routes. You know, found the uh, Miles Davis Bitches Brew. Was a, a lot of people yeah. did that were into rock and maybe rock and pop stuff, and it kind of gets you into that scene. And then you, you know, like everything, you dig deeper and deeper. And then you know, it's interesting with Blue Note. When the ac whole acid jazz thing happened in the UK, Blue Note. Yeah. This is a lot later. We're talking early nineties. Yeah. No. There were these albums, Blue Break Beats, which were Blue Note. And a lot of people associated that sort of funky jazz style with Blue Note around that time. But it's only, you know, it's when you look back to the 1500s, you know, the early days of Blue Note, you know, when we get into the early 50s and you get that, those amazing hard bop records, you know, Hank Mobley, Lee Morgan, yeah, artists like that, Horace Silver, Art Blakey. That's a whole different thing, you know. Yes. And that, when you get really deep into it and you get to that stuff, that's when there's no turning back, you know. So people got into it maybe with the later, you know, a bit, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of strange pathway. But we all end up at that sort of crazy early stuff and everybody trying to get, get these crazy records, you know. Nadine, Lady Soul Disco and Blue Note. What's your take? I'm oh. actually a big fan. And yeah. I wish I uh, could have uh, a million dollars to, <laughs> to get all the ones because for me, this whole thing is a piece of art. It's like Dave already described. Uh, when I saw, first time I saw these records in a record store, I was amazed by the cover art, by the font they used. And I thought these were done, records done like a couple of years ago, which was 20 years back, but it was actually done late 50s to 60s. And this is absolutely fantastic. Plus the sound quality those mm -hmm. records have. The instrumental separation sometimes, that's absolutely amazing. And I wish I would have started collected, uh, collecting these records 20 years ago. But nowadays, like... Yeah, but, but I was surprised when I saw the uh, collection on the shop. Uh, I, I expected some way, way more expensive. So... Mm. Yes. <laughs> Tempted. <laughs> I checked. I just about 15 minutes ago, I was on on the uh, starting page of the OBC shop, and I was like scrolling down. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And this just can't be an original one. And I clicked on it, and it's an original one. So okay. price wise, this is very fair. Now, when it comes to those original Daves, and I think we we already talked about that, but let's do it here again on the, at the OBC streams we did those. OGs from Blue Note, they are pressed like tanks, right? Because we already stated that you have those records and they sometimes doesn't look that good, that hot. But when yeah, you the put them on... Pressings, the Plastilite the Plastilite pressings, the, yeah. early, you know, the monos, um, they are, they're, they're, they're beautifully pressed, you know, obviously extremely well engineered. Uh, Rudy Van Gelder is very important, you know, he obviously had uh, an amazing ear to cut this music. And, you know, those monos are fantastic. And you can get a, one that looks beaten up. Yeah, yeah. It looks like lo loads of marks on it. We put it on a dedicated, you know, a dedicated mono cartridge and you put it on there and it will sing, you know, and the marks will mean nothing. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm when I'm, if I'm looking at blue notes, if I'm buying blue notes, I don't mind going a bit down, you know, because I want them to listen to a little bit further down the grading scale because I know, particularly with those, that I'm going to get something that's very playable. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thomas, here's a question from Hey Joe, because this record is already gone at the shop. Do you have another honeybee for for Hey Joe? Um, I can't remember what it is. It's it's a, <laughs> you put it on the shop and it's gone. You will look it up. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, let's, let's maybe maybe after the first round of talking, let let's get into some music. Give give us some some more impressions of an, of nice original. By the way, yeah. Thomas, what you had in your hand there is one of my favorites, the Lee Morgan in search of new land. I love that. That's one of my favorites you had there. Yeah, I saw somebody asked for it, but right. but I was thinking to go back first, and then uh, because you said like in 1951, the first Blue Note record came out. Mm. Yeah. Well, this is this is the very first blue note. That's a ten inch. though. you got to remember this is blue notes. The first ones are no. ten inches. But uh, this is not a ten inch. I'm quite sure. Well, no, that's yeah. No, hold on. No, that's maybe a maybe it's the first twelve inch, Dave. Can that be? Oh, oh sorry. Go. Oh, sorry. Thomas has very small hands. Okay. I know what I'm talking about, Mike. <laughs> Sorry, 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 sorry. It just looked so big. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Rare. That's a very rare ten inch that. Come, let, let's let's listen to some of the very first blue note. Fats Navarro. Okay. Okay, I'll 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 choose one, one of my favorites. Yeah? Okay, cool. Mm, this one. Yeah, so Afro that's dangerous. Yeah. That's Afro Cuban, Kenny Dora. Yeah. yeah. And you know. Yeah, that's it. That's serious business, that, yeah? Let's get into it. It came out later on 12 inch, but it was looking like this. Uh, yeah, we, we a lot of us has this from Music Matters Jazz as one of the reissues, either the uh, uh, regular one or the SRX. Lovely record, great job by Music Matters Jazz. And also quite pricey nowadays. So, so don't think that those reissues are always uh, very, very cheap. Okay. Oh, and and it's, also, it's also one of those who really talked to me. A lot of the Blue Note I like because it's well played and it, it sounds so good. But yeah. the, like, this one is also getting to my heart where if you like, okay, this is what we really like. So I'll just play a little bit of this. Yeah, cool. Are those all ten inches? <laughs> Them has been uh, re released as this one. Oh, I like the question from Justin Peters. Thomas, do you prefer the sound of the 12 inch or the 10 inch Afro Cuban? Uh, I, I, I do the 12 inch. The sound is better on the 12 inches, I think. Even though the other one is earlier, I think the 10 inch is from like 51, 52, while this one is from 55, as I remember, 56 or something. But the, the sound and the quality of the it's much it's better than to say that the 10 inches came first right so you know blue note started off doing a lot of trad jazz you know but they got in very early into the modernist scene so the modern scene about 1951 1951 they started doing the 10 inch range and they started doing this new uh elmo hope's brilliant by the way i love elmo hope um they started doing the uh uh the, the 10 inches for the modern the new new faces, new sounds, yeah. And this is where you see the introduction of a lot of their famous artists. So Lou Donaldson, 
um, uh, Hoy Silva. Uh, you know, you've got the right, you've got the, the 10 inches of the Art Blakey at Birdland. And you've got to remember the one after that. So they're the 5,000 series. Then you've got the, the, the ones that everybody wants, the 1500 series. Now, the, a lot of those, they're actually compilation. The early ones are compilations of the 10 inches. Yeah, so they they went on to the 12 inch, but their compilations. Also, Rudy Van Gelder didn't cut a lot of the yeah. 10s. He only yeah. came in later. So that's why the 10 inches, um, the 12 inches sound really, really good. Okay, interesting. And, and and you as a collector also went for the 12 inches, if I remember correctly, although you have some 10 inches, right, Dave? I don't have issues with 10s. I like 10 inches. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I kind of like the covers on some of the early ones as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. There's people that kind of shy away from 10 inches. You know, the format is it's a little bit more, um, well, you know, you're putting it on your deck into 10 inches, just a touch more awkward. You know, obviously you're not getting as much on the side. But, I, you know, I again, from the classical series, yeah, there's quite a lot of classical that was put out on 10 inches as well, particularly in yes. France. So, yes. you know, they're both good, basically. Yeah. Nadine, your My favorite three Blue Note titles. Come on. Nice My question, right? Three. Nice question. So, out of nothing, huh? I like the Signwinder. I mm -hmm. like Monan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like most everything from Miles Davis on them. I like the John Coltrane stuff he did. Mm -hmm. so, and what I think is very fascinating, what always fascinates me the most is that Rudy Van Gelder, when he was in the studio and stereo came up, he recorded mm -hmm. on two separate machines at the same time, mono and stereo. Exactly. Exactly. And this is for me so forth seeing and so fantastic. That's I love this guy. What he did, that was absolutely stunning. To, to do that at the same time and thinking so ahead, just fantastic. And he was one of the first master engineers to embrace digital. Okay. Really? I, if I'm not if I'm not mixing something up here, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. has its advantages. Uh, so yeah. many people from the classical. Uh, yeah, yeah. Josh Gordon explained it. It makes things way more convenient. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, also German composers, especially in the beginning of the 80s, when a Deutsche Grammophon was getting into CDs, many conductors preferred the digital recording because it was uh, way easier and they could do more things about it. Dave, there, have, has, there, there are certain, certain time frames when it comes to, to the Blue Note titles, you also can see those in the Blue Note numbers of mm -hmm. that of their of their releases. As I know that you are you love those numbers and you know numbers like nobody else, at least when it comes to classical. With um, classical, I do. Yeah. With, uh, can you do Blue that with the Blue Note test, too? But... Sorry. Can you, do, can you do that with the Blue Note 2 and give us a little overview? About those 4,000 or 1,500, or, or is well, yeah, the, uh, so the 1,500 is the first series, and they're the ones yeah. that you know people people go crazy. They'll they'll remortgage mm. their houses to get them, basically. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they're so insane. But the 4,000 series came out a bit, uh, you know, a bit later. Yeah. Um, and like it's interesting that he mentions about the mono and stereo because I, you know, I love I love dedicated mono. Uh, I also love stereo, and it's interesting uh, that there were, you know, he he did uh, both separately, which I think mm -hmm. is a great thing. You know, uh, I I, th I think that's definitely the right thing to be doing. Um, and some of, even in the fifteen hundred series, because I, you know, for example, like John Coltrane Blue Train, I believe that was the very first dedicated stereo uh, that okay. he did, and the stereo has a lovely gold sticker on the cover. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the people collect both. I, I, you know, that's a very deep rabbit hole to discuss the the differences and the benefits. I know people that love the the blue note stereos, and you know, and people that love the blue note monos. Well, you know, in the perfect world, and you've got plenty, uh, very very yeah. deep pockets, you get both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, which which way do you prefer, Dave? You prefer right. the mono, the monos? Okay. I'm a mono head anyway for everything. I like monoing yeah. classical as yeah. well. So. I've, I've, so I've, thought, I've, I've, I've mother head all day long. I am. Nadine? So what I thought was super interesting was when they did the reissue of John Coltrane's Blue Train. I think two years ago, 
yeah. when they oh, released uh, it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they released it as a mono and a stereo version, that was cool. Uh, I went for the stereo version because uh, you got two LPs with the second LP where you get some outtakes and all, all of this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I got more for the money. So I, I went for this, but I was really thinking about also getting the mono one because I have some, uh, especially some records from the UK, from Decca, the James Bond uh, soundtrack Goldfinger in, in mono. That yeah. sounds absolutely, when Goldfinger is hitting up the speakers, that sounds in, in, amazing. So mono can sound damn good. Did you just say amazing? I love it. No, I said damn good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, what, what do you have a preferred or favorite period when it comes to the Blue Note label? Or are you in it throughout the whole time? No. Um, when, I, when I collect, I started from like number 1500. Mm -hmm. And then I go through and try to learn by numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I, I put a little bit the numbers together here. So yeah, okay. No, the, cool. the, the five thousand series, which are the ten inches, there was there was seventy records made. Okay. From nineteen fifty one to nineteen fifty five. Okay. And then came the fifteen hundred series, which was a lot of reissues, like Dave said, and um, they came from nineteen fifty five until nineteen fifty nine. So you have a hundred records that has the fifteen hundred series, and from there they jump to number four thousand. Yeah, but but that means they put out two records a month in average. Wow. Yeah. Quite productive. So four thousand came out from fifty nine to sixty two, so they put out a hundred records in that period, and those are really collectible. Most of them as well. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and and from, from number 4400 i think it goes a little bit down with the quality mm -hmm. and the interest of the but the 4100 4, series came from 62 to 65 and that was the that was their most uh, 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 um, popular time right if i'm not mistaken yeah yeah Is you could say some of the biggest hit came at that, uh, uh, at that uh, period uh, and then they, they put out 4,200 to 4,277 from mm -hmm. 65 to 68. Okay. And then and then they have put out some 4,300 numbers, but that's they're more spread out because at the same time there were uh, another company bought them up and they changed the numbers to the BALA system. That was the Liberty, uh, right, Thomas? They changed Liberty Records. Yeah, yeah. So Liberty. The, the labels change as well. You know, so yeah. Uh, Thomas, <laughs> Thomas uh, uh, Snake Oil Audio, a good friend of the channel. We do the Monday streams in the German BC together. Um, ask you if you can play Saint Thomas from Sonny Rollins. Maybe when you go through it, maybe you see it. We can play it a little later if you see it. Um, yeah. But, but. Take you you know me with the titles. I need to find. I them. know. I know. <laughs> Thomas always needs the jacket. <laughs> the jacket number. But, but give us a nice tune from Blue Note if you have one one prepared. Otherwise, we do more talking. I, okay. I, think, yeah, um, I have them in in orders by numbers. That's why it's difficult. So ah, okay. Them. So the best way of doing is if you want to request a title, give Thomas the number. Yeah, you see the number. So here yeah. you have the stereo, and here you have the mono. This is an amazing record, by the way. I love it. It's amazing, yeah. So here again, you have the mono. Yeah. And the stereo. All right, if it two. is on saxophone colossus, it will be quite difficult to find it on Blue Note, if I'm not mistaken. That's yeah, pretty that's prestige uh, uh, uh it's a different label <laughs> that's <awesome>. yeah that's <laughs> i have it as well yeah but that's not on blue note so but we will do a prestige so we will we will prepare it for our prestige evening yeah. so then hit us uh, if you find the time or maybe you have prepared one title give us give us a little blue note music we talk way too much <laughs> Really? I have no idea. I'm yeah. 
Yeah, I think we have we had a question for this album a little bit earlier. on. Another mm -hmm. demo. I think when it's, it's safe to say that you have some of the for the time period they stayed with Blue Note. I mean, Art Blakey. This goes over decades, uh, Dave, right? When it comes yeah, you had some artists that are very prolific. I mean, yeah. Art Blakey is a very good example, yeah. you know, that they would record over, you know, such a, a big, big period with the label. 20 yeah. years, 25 years. Uh, right from the very roots, you know, Art Blakey was around at the very start, and yeah. you know he was recording right the way through, um, and put out, you know, I, I couldn't tell you its exact number, but it's a lot, yeah. It is a lot, yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, again, a lot of the artists, yeah, they they were around. You know, I'm very keen. I, lo I love Lee Morgan's music. He he was brilliant. There's a again, there's a really uh, great documentary you can find about Lee Morgan. Yes. Um, Online, I, I called one. him Morgan. I think it's it's. I called him Morgan. It's on Netflix. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing uh, documentary. Really good to watch that. To watch yeah. it if you yeah. can. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah uh, brilliant. Gives you some real insight into that whole scene. Um, you know, I love the, the the whole idea of it, and it's just wonderful. You know, that you had um, had the you know all these bit. No, Francis Wolf doing all these pitch. You know, all this photography. So capturing it all is so important. You know, really, really yeah, cool. And, and you know what? I always wonder, maybe you have some more insights on, on this, Dave. It's almost like there were a group of people that that changed left and right. And then they play in this combination and this. Then he is the leader. Then he is the leader. Uh, at daytime, they recorded record. Nighttime, they were on stage. Uh, tough times, right? I tough mean, times. They were, you know, if you look at a lot of these artists, you'll see, and you're right, they recorded across numerous LP, you know, recorded numerous sessions, yeah, and then those sessions are then committed to vinyl. So you'll find the same artists appearing on, on many of the LPs, and, and that applies to a lot of them, you know. So, in fact, if you look up here, he's one of them, yeah. Mike Quebec. Yeah, yeah, he was there early. He was um, right at the start with Blue Note. He was their talent scout, yeah. And okay. he also recorded, you'll find him, he did some amazing, you know, just a very small handful of amazing LPs. I've like got Blues blues and Sentimental. Mm -hmm. um, you've got It Might As Well Be Spring, which is, I love that record. You yeah. know, he was, you know, they, it was a, just a, a, it was a very beautiful thing that was going on. And, um, yeah, I mean, they recorded across everybody else's. They were recording in, in very, you know, different sessions. And, you know, that's why you end up, when you start getting Blue Note, you kind of want to get them all. That's true, because <laughs> you, you, you see the next one. Oh, it's with him, too. Oh, here is here is here is uh, this guy again. That, yeah. I totally agree. It's almost like when you start with a series, you want to have them all. And and, and now, uh, I mean, getting getting every record where Art Blakey is part of, or Lee Bobby Morgan is a really part dangerous of. decision with Blue Note. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is for sure. It is for sure. And uh, um, um, but but I think the the whole jazz world, even those little later European jazz scene, has been heavily influenced by Blue Note, right? Oh yeah, massively. And also there are artists, you know, over I know you know over here in the UK, yeah. you know, all the big players like Tubby Hayes, Ronnie Scott. You know, they were, you know, in awe of the American jazz musicians. And, um, that, and, you know, you think about the drummers that we had over here, Phil Seaman, people like that. You know, that, that we, we were just caught, you know, mimicking their style. Yeah. But it's important to point out there were some artists that came over here that went over to America and recorded for Blue Note. So a good example is Dizzy Reese. He was, um, you know, uh, a Jamaican yeah, musician. He came over yeah. on the Windrush generation over to the yeah. UK, right? Yeah. And then 
he went on to record for Blue Note. He went to the States, yeah. He put out um a, 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 an LP on Tempo Progress Report, and then there's a few EPs as well. And then and then he's recorded on Blue Note, you know. So it's it's, it's really really cool, you know. You can uh, I love it that there's a bit of a crossover there. Totally, but, uh, totally, totally. And and Dave, help us out with one question. Of course, we have the iconic first pressings which usually have the highest collectability yeah but but we also have very early quite sometimes really really early reissues what's your personal take on those as a dealer and collector well i like them i mean i don't you know everybody wants you know they're getting the the 1500 series they they want to see that lexington avenue address on there Mm -hmm. so they want the deep groove. They want they they want the, you know they want all the, all the characteristics of the early ones. And then, you know, the thing is, you, you know, the, the labels change, the address changes. You've got like uh, there, there's so many variations with Blue Note, and I think you can get quite bogged down in all of that. And you're right, Michael, that there's maybe not the first what is considered to be the very first label, but it might be a slightly later label with the slightly later address or even doesn't have to be a deep groove you know the groove profile changes mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. as well but you're still going to get a great sound off those so you don't have to be sort of fighting over is, that. is it is it is it too much to ask if, if if i ask you if you can go through some of those characteristics would that be possible do you no, have I one i can do that i can show oh that would be amazing if you go go through some of those character characteristics for those of of us who who are not yeah, completed I can, I, can well. show, I can show some of the early um oh that's great yeah in fact i've got some good examples actually i'll show uh i'll do this a bit on the fly because yeah, yeah i know i know that's why i ask carefully <laughs> i can show i can sh certainly show some uh so look I've got an example, you know, this is uh, uh, Blue Note 15, the second Miles Davis, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you've got the, uh, let me get it out of the plastic here. Can you make Dave big? Uh, he is big. I am. So there we go. <laughs> no. <Turn up. laughs> On the whole screen. There we go. So Blue Note 1502. So 1501, nice. this is volume two. You've got the first yeah. Miles Davis with the orange 1501. Mm -hmm. And so that you've got the Lexington address. And I'll show that on the label like this. There we go. So you've got yeah. Blue Note Records. It's done in this sort of uh, joined up handwriting style with the original Lexington Avenue NYC address there. In fact, you can see here as well, it's kind of good I've got this angle. So look, if you look at the bottom there in the middle, you can see the RVG etched. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. all the early ones, they have this RV, you know, you want the Rudy Van Gelder etched, yeah? yeah. Um, you know, there's different variations of that. There's then machine stamped later where it's RVG, but it's machine stamped. And then you've actually got Van Gelder as well, machine stamped. If you just look now on the, let's go slightly over there to the right, you'll see the Plastilite <laughs> P, also known as the ear, yeah? So the, the, <laughs> everybody likes to say it's an ear, but it's actually a, it's a P, recursive P there. Which gives I you the in the dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Now I'm not sure. I don't think this one. I'm going to try and work my way round. Yeah. See, because what you can also see on a lot of the early ones, you see them on the ten inches. There's um a nine uh, a nine M, so like a nine and an M below it. Yeah. And that's like a, a reference code for Plastilite because they had they had different um they pressed not just for Blue Note but for other labels as well, and they had like a code reference. But you can see that you can see that on um, certainly on the ten inches you have that. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, it's a classic deep groove label, and you've got the Lexington address, right? Ah, so yeah, Justin. So the, I'll tell you something interesting. Frame jackets, right? Now this is a Japanese style uh, of jack uh, of making a jacket. Now the classic frame jacket um, is the way the fold is done. Now this one, unfortunately, is taped, but. Hey, you can't have everything. See, <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be like that with Blue Note, by the way. What you hear me say there, I'm not, you know, I'm cool with this. But, um, yeah. Uh, uh, the original frame okay, wait, wait, Thomas can show it. Maybe you can explain it. Oh, yeah. Go, yeah. Oh, right. Oh, nice. That is not framed, but it has like this. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, 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 Thomas, are you happy as well? Yeah. Yeah. Then we're I'm both so happy. happy. 
I'm happy. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you what the frame is. Now, this one, actually, this one is a, a, a slightly later jacket, I can tell. But the original early frame jacket, uh-huh. you will see you you'll see a sort of edge along the bottom and, and along the spine, but not at the top. And it's to do with the way that they constructed the jacket. Because, you know, you'll see later ones where you'll see an edge all the way around. And mm-hmm. that's not actually, that's a, a, late, a slightly later jacket, yeah. So people go mad for these early frame jackets. I might, I might have an example here. Let me have a look on the 10. Because on the 10 inch, yeah, in fact, this, yeah, this is a frame. So I can show this is really nice at Miles Davis Volume 3, yeah? Nice. And if you look very closely at the top there, you'll see a little edge running along here. And then also down the spine edge there. But then uh-huh. there, isn't, there isn't one at the bottom. Now, that's a proper proper frame jacket, that one. They, you can spot them, but you've got to sort of check in the light. But don't let it change your decision about buying the record, yeah? You know, it's nice to have these, but... Still buy it anyway. If you're holding it in your hand and you're going, "Oh, has it got a frame?" Oh no, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna put it back. I'm not gonna take it. That's the wrong, the wrong mindset. <laughs> but why was the frame there anyway? Has that something to do with the production of the label that you can it's, see it's these? An early, it's an early. It was an early method <laughs> construction method to make these types of sleeves, and I then see. they changed the method of construction a little bit later. So, so but, they, yeah. but they changed it during the 10 inch time or did they change it during the 12 inch time? Do you well, know I've that? Well, I've seen 10 inch, I, I've seen, mul- you know, I've seen all different variations. In fact, yeah, look, Thomas has got it here. He can show you. So, Thomas, so Thomas, that's the, fir- the, 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 that's the first record, right? Yeah. And see there, look, you can see that's a frame because it's got the edge, but only down one, one side of it. So, that, you know, and is there one along the top? No. No. There's on the top, uh, top and uh, top and side. Yeah, top and side. So just two edges, yeah. where people think you know you could, on the later ones you can see like an edge all the way around, and that's not a that's not a sort of purist frame jacket. That's the later construction method. So yeah, it's a very deep rabbit hole all of this when you get down to these. Yeah, but I love areas. when we go deep on these streams. Dave, did somebody ever start tried to write a book about this? Yeah, probably. Yeah, there are. Or yeah, there's, and also there's loads. If you look online, I mean, there's loads of great resources. You know, um, uh, there's there's a great website if you want to look it up called London Jazz Collector. That guy, he's brilliant. He gets into the real. You know, if you want a bit of late night reading about nitty gritty details of pressings, that's the place to go. So uh, yeah. Yeah, we call very, this yeah. very British here in Germany when somebody does this. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got, um, hold on, I wanted to show you as well. Yeah. I did this. So I'm just going to show a, a slightly later label, but again, one that's very collectible. Now, this is Milt Jackson, that, you know, with Thelonious Monk. A really nice, a really nice record. Uh, one, you know, Blue Note 1509. Um, but uh, this isn't a first pressing, but it doesn't matter because it's still, you know, look, it's it's a super heavy, heavy record. It's, yeah. it's got all the characteristics, but this is um this is the Blue Note Records at the foot 47 West 63rd Street address. But if you notice, it's got New York 23. Now you can get a lot of those early. Um, you know, you'll find a lot of the early 1500 series that you can get with this New York 23. And you know, to be honest with you. You know they're, they're great. You know they, they sound as good as uh, the, the Lexingtons. It's just a it's just a, a label change. You know, um, again, I, I, like I say, you don't want to get too hung up on it, really. Um, and these these are super. And if you get one, you should buy it anyway because they're still super super rare. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. Hey, it's a question from Stanti. I don't know if it's serious or it should be funny. Have you heard about late 50s, 16 RPM LPs? From Prestige and Blue Note. Yeah, and I've actually got one or two as well. Stunty's totally right. So yeah. Prestige did uh, uh, four, I believe, um, 16 RPM records. Now, 16 RPM was actually used. The reason they introduced that speed, it was actually for spoken word. But 
some people tried to, well, you know, some labels thought it'd be a great way to fit an absolute ton of music onto onto a disc. So Prestige did experiment with this, and there's a there's a great one that's got the um, I think it's three trombones. Um, it's got a great Andy Warhol cover, and it's actually at 16 RPM. Yeah, so he's right there. Thomas, there's a question for you from me dio okay from someone sorry uh, uh do you have the sabo martinez 1561 that's a that's a really nice record that's it let's play something come on let's let's if you find it that fast you probably have prepared something yeah, i love this record as well so and it's different from all the other records from Bruno. okay it's um it has its own It's coming up here. Yeah. I think. I oh. think. We hope. Here it comes. Here we go. Thank you. Fake to say that's Latin. Dave, are you aware of this, Bruno? Yeah, I am, yeah. I had one once, but I sold it to a very good friend of mine. It has to be a very good friend if you sell this one. <laughs> About a long time ago, though. Thomas, any spare copies for the OBC? Uh, I have a later copy. Okay. Yeah. This, uh... yeah, so that's got the Blue Note Records Inc. address on it. So the ink is, uh, again, slightly later. And it's got NYC at the end. So, yeah, there's so many label variations. And you there see, are like, so many label variations, Dave, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's loads of label variations. So that's really, why a lot, I, I just yeah. that's why I say try to be mellow. See, there's that got the New York 23 on the other side. See, this is oh no, look, it's a Liberty. So that's a Liberty address. You see, so uh, there, there's different. Again, we're going later now when Liberty Records took over Blue Note, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I can imagine, Dave, that that also the 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 original and the very first reissue they probably have different labels right and that's how you identify them and the matrix yeah yeah, yeah i mean it, well i think i think you'd see a lot of the same matrix you know the inscription the matrix would be very similar it's just purely label variations to identify yeah. uh potentially a, a slightly later year but yeah. you know if you're getting a record within you know sound wise it's not going to be a huge difference i don't think mm -hmm. that's why i say try not to get too hung up on it <laughs> yeah that's very important i think that's very important and i really would like to to put some attention to this on this stream quality wise the very very first pressing and the very very early reissue aren't that much of a difference is that safe to say i would agree and i, I think it would be uh very difficult to actually perceive that with human hearing yeah? yeah but there might be you know if you have a you know, could put, potentially be a much bigger difference between a an early 1950s blue note and say a, a late 60s reissue but i do think from hearing all this i knew it was complicated but i think if you're a hunt for for these records you kind of really need to prepare yourself or write it down of what you have to look for actually right 
because now they're selling, yeah, yeah, this is a first press, pay like uh, a thousand pound or two thousand or whatever, and mm. you, you come home and later find out it's it's not. So you really kind of dig into it somehow if you want a real original one. True. That's I, true. I think the, the original ones can be so expensive and and a lot of time they are also a little bit beaten up. So they have a little bit of uh, life to them. So so if you really want it to sound good, you might not go for the first issue all the time because they can be really, really expensive and really, really rare to get. But, but, but Thomas, about what kind of price range are we talking about The uh, having the original one with all the credentials that it needs to have yeah, i think the most expensive ones are around six seven thousand euro i think maybe and, and, and which are those which are the most ex probably moaning right moaning is not that expensive it's uh okay. it's hang mostly uh, hang Mobley, uh tina brooks uh um uh, uh Sonny Clark, maybe this one is ex expensive. This one is expensive. It's from Griffin, but it's because it's uh, Andy Warhol. Yeah. Andy Warhol uh, jacket, right? He, but, he but uh, here, this, this, uh, okay. Hang Mobley, it's quite expensive. So you have like 20,000 euros in your hands now, if I count seven? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure. Be, if you want them in perfect condition, they will be like that. Okay. This cool Stratton is also among the more expensive, right? The Sonny Clark is very expensive, yeah. yeah. The cool Stratton, uh, I think uh, I had it here at one point. But that's also a fantastic cover, by the way. The, this oh. whole record is great. So what, what comes up in this in, in, in the gallery is Mobley 1568. Yeah, that's the one with the pic, the silhouette of him on the cover with the saxophone yeah. which is very rare very okay. expensive i mean again i know two people that have got that here um it's a very expensive rate you know that's one of the um, and the, you know that's that'll be sort of hitting for a pristine one over ten thousand. wow oh. okay how how does this come hasn't it been that successful at the time or or, or why is that well you know that what well, that's one of the reasons why a lot of records become very rare mm -hmm. Mm. In the, maybe they they didn't weren't as long in the catalog i mean that's certainly the case for some of the rare classical records yeah. Yeah. and i would imagine it probably applies to some blue notes as well because you know some of the really famous ones you know you think of the ones that really made it sidewinder you know there, there's other ones that where they actually pressed quite a lot of them so mm. uh i think it's the ones that were maybe less per you know they didn't uh print so many of them that are now really wanted you know hank mobley is obviously considered one of the best uh yeah. you know so one of the best artists and now his records are really revered a lot of the league of morgan stuff's very expensive as well so the early ones um yeah it's a it's a minefield michael <laughs> it is it is that's why we are here you want to show some records uh, I, still... just, yeah, I don't have the first issue of this one but it okay. looks like this Ah, this that's one, of one yeah. okay, yeah. okay. That, that's the one that, that is sort of considered the rarest. Wow, but this is a reissue, okay. okay. And what kind of reissue is that, Thomas? The second, the third? What... Uh, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's uh, I don't think it's been reissued that much, so you don't have like a second and a third of this one. I mm -hmm. think it's it went many years before the reissue. It. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I, I, I heard once that first issue when they put out, they don't know how many they actually pressed at that time. But That's on, but it was it was written on the the inner paper how many they did, and those those papers disappeared. But the the rare one was around two thousand copies, I think. Mm -hmm. wow. That's not much. Yeah, if you but consider that 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 vinyl was the only medium, then this is not much. This no, is not. Uh, and and uh, uh, and at that point they didn't think about rare or uh, that it should be something. So mm -hmm. they just put another. They, they did another batch uh, three months later, or half a year later. And sometimes they had some some records left from the first batch. On the second batch, they had the second cover. So so uh, even on yeah, the, yeah, yeah. 
even on a uh, Miles Davis uh, uh, blue train. Don't quote him. Mm-hmm. They have a deep crew and sometimes without the deep crew, but with the same uh, bats, and they all look the same. The same few years. Okay. Mix labels as well. They would mix the labels up from one side to the other. So I've seen yeah, a yeah. train where it's got the, you know, the West Six, uh, you know, the, the address will change. So you'll see one where it will be variation on the same disc from the A side to the B side. And it's just but, but, there has to be a, but there has to be a definition, Dave, what is considered to be the very first pressing or isn't there when it comes to the blue train? Is there or not? I think with the blue train, there isn't a Lexington of that because it's a bit too late. So it would be the one with the, the earliest version of that is the one that has the New York 23. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe with the blue train, again, so look, you're testing me here. I try. I try my best. <laughs> you can only get the, the, the New York 23 just yeah. on one side of it only. Because the New York 23 was the label version that came out straight after the Lexington. And I, yeah. I know that there's a blue train that's got that certainly on one side. I don't think there's ever been one scene that it's got it on both sides. Okay. I think the first one had uh, the, the, uh, uh, 74 West. Isn't that the first one? Yeah, that's right, Thomas. But you can get one that says New York 23 rather than NYC at the end. So that's the, there, there is, because I've had it once a very, very long time ago. But that's right. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's a, that's a, you know, they're first. Yeah, 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 I get you. I get you. Don't get totally crazy, right? No, you see. Yeah. That's yeah, how, it, yeah. how it can go with these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's even more complicated than the uh, Black Sabbath management credits in a way. I mean, the management credits in that regard is is quite easy. Uh, 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 that stuff thing. play school. That stuff play school compared to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but probably because at that time they weren't aware that this is going to happen. That those records become that collectible. And they just didn't care. So give me this inner sleeve and give me this label and put on this label. Who cares? Nobody cared at the time, right? With you, it's what they would have had le- left at the pressing plant. They've got mm. a little pile of labels left over a particular address on it. Yeah. And then they were moving to another one. They would have just used that to finish off the print run. It's not at the end of the day. If you've got a good re- record that sounds good, be happy. Yeah. They didn't have the money to, to do a big batch. So they, 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 they made it an independent uh, uh, companies at that time, and they, they needed to pay up front for getting the records done. <laughs> so they, they made like two thousand, and then they sold. They made two thousand more. It was not like mm-hmm. a, it was not like a big money machine at that time. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, uh, Alfred, who uh, who uh, made the record, produced the record, he always told <laughs> the artist that. They are in charge of how how uh, they want to do the music. He was not like controlling it, but mm-hmm. he, Rudy van Gelder, he uh, he recorded it so well. He just wanted to to uh, to get down on vinyl uh, that time's uh, uh, music, which nobody did at that time. Thomas, treat us with some music. <laughs> This is such a great, fantastic Blue Note record, right? And one one of those that are a little more out there. Yeah, and it's very different from everything else. It has its own uh, own style. Got I like yeah. that. Yeah, he loved it. I know that he, stunt he loved it. But... Thank <laughs> you. 
นาทีนะ So they launch the free experimental jazz, right? Oh, I adore it. I, I love. I, it feels like Brötzmann, you know. No, it doesn't feel like Brötzmann. It's, it's totally like different. Like It's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think when you collect jazz, I think a lot for me is what we in Denmark call dad jazz. It's like a you you feel comfortable and like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of them are a little bit more different, and the, and the more you listen to, the more you start to love the the, the special but, ones. But yes. but let me guess, and this is really a guess now because I didn't look it up. The the dolphin now is one of the more rarer ones. I I I, I can imagine nowadays that this is one of the harder to get ones. Or am I totally wrong, Dave Thomas? Um, I, I would say it's, it is it is wanted that record. And I'd say it's one that is a bit because it's more wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it, it achieves more that you know. It, it's more expensive. It is one of the one. That's one of the ones that people like to buy. Yeah. You know, and they don't mind forking out for it. You know, whereas Jimmy Smith, for example, which I actually like. Also, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of his later records, they're they're still pretty cheap to buy. Really. Yes. Right. Uh, what Eric is it with Dolphy, Eric Dolphy's got a big following, you know? Yeah, and 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 Dave, how is it with Grant Green nowadays? When it comes to the reissue, this guy is really, really popular and right so and in my opinion. The originals are popular as well, for sure. They are. Yeah. They are okay. Yeah, and they're obviously a lot. They're in the four thousand series, you know. Yeah. When I think about sort of guitar, you know, you've got Kenny Burrell. Who recorded? Yeah. You know, you've obviously got the introducing Kenny Burrell um, yes. on the in, on the uh, the 1500 series, but you know Kenny Burrell, and like a lot of artists, he recorded the, on Prestige as well. So the Prestige one is brilliant with Kenny Burrell, highly recommended. But you know, obviously with Blue Note, there's the famous ones with the Andy Warhol covers. You see, yeah. and they they they're collected for that reason as well. You know. No, that's not the reason, Stanti. You have a, you have an email. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Thomas, oh Thomas is is busy right now. Thomas, Dave, any chance that we will see an will an, an auto lunch at the shop? I can tell you. I can tell you though that you will see. Tons of Blue Note within the next days and weeks and months at the shop. Really a lot. Really a lot. Uh, the first ones are already uh, 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 at the shop. I don't know if Auto Lunch will be in the shop. Thomas, Dave. I'm sure Thomas can, uh, can, uh, can do that at some point. He, he, he's got plenty tucked away over there. I saw a nice copy of Wayne Shorter Juju at the back there. Okay, well. that, that, that looks promising. That looks yeah. promising. Okay. I think I have never seen a live stream ever in the whole YouTube time where somebody holds like five different John Coltrane's, three <laughs> versions of other ones, and like 10 inch this, 10 inch this. This is from 1951 or 1952. Oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, that's why we are here now, uh, Nadine. I told you we we tried different things this year. I promised you. Stunning Remember, that and amazing. <laughs> you said stunning and amazing. Wow, I Absolutely. like it. Michael, we spent too much time together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. so that that as I said looks promising. So there might be an uh, out to lunch shortly. Um, hey, hey Joe, I can see a really good record. Uh, thanks, Hey Joe, for that. Yeah, it is in the mate. I, lo I love Gigi, it's a great album. I was just looking on Thomas's wall, I can see the a really good one at the top. I like Bobby Hutchison, Stick Up, and um, that was originally issued as a stereo. But interestingly, Michael, there's something that maybe some people don't know is even then, a Blue Note would still make mono copies for use at radio stations. Ah, okay, okay, there's actually a mono. A mono copy of that as well, and they did it so it could be played at American radio stations. Uh, do you, but 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 this uh, uh, version you just talked about, Dave, 
that didn't go to the record stores. It just went no. to. Ah, wow, wow, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, they have continue, ever... you know, even when they kind of stopped doing it as you know, once they moved to stereo properly, yeah, and they were doing it as their main, the main format. Yeah, uh, they would still make mono versions of certain. I believe they're fold downs. They're not true mono, but there'd be a stereo, be a fold down. And uh, the reason they do it is a lot of radio stations were well, they they, they played mono records. So have you, a, have you ever thing. seen those those copies or listened to yes, those? Yes, you, you can see them out there, mm -hmm. and they tend to have a little sticker on them as well to say that it's a mono oral version. Can we see an example of this sticker? Are we lucky and you have one or Thomas have one? Do you have oh, one, Dan? I, I don't have it. I've got that, okay. but I don't have it in hand. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, of course. Yeah, I don't I don't have this one with the sticker on, but I have a I have a, I have one here, I think. No, it will take me a few minutes. I'll find one where you have it. Cool. <laughs> Manfred, uh, you know, I want to have a stream. I want to have a stream with Manfred and Stanti. <laughs> that would be a legendary stream. <laughs> okay, Thomas, give us give us some music, please. Yeah. It, it, it was the record I was trying to find. Um, oh, yeah? It has a stereo sticker with done, but but sure. uh, it's. I have a different version here, but I'll play a little bit here. It's one of those that are beautifully made, and and it's one of my favorite records as well. It's um, this yes. one. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, and um, at that time, as I heard, uh, Miles <laughs> Davis was not, was not allowed to put out in Blue Note uh, as a lead name because he had a contract with the. Uh, um, uh, Prestige. Columbia. Oh, Prestige, yeah, I can't remember. Prestige, maybe or Columbia. Yeah, and uh, so he was putting up as uh, the second name on 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 it. Yes. Yeah. But it it came out at the same time as. Um, yeah. This one. Ah. Yeah. 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 Never so heard it, of it. And Never heard it was of like it. it was like a following up to this mm -hmm. one. So it has the same feeling, the same kind as this one. This one, in my opinion, this one should be this one, number two. But I'll play a little bit and we can talk about it. Here comes Miles Davis. Thomas, um, I have to ask because I'm really, really, really interested in original. How deep have I ever get into my pockets when it comes to a good original for this record. This one is not that rare, so it's 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 uh, it's affordable. Original. Okay, I have to ask again: How much would be affordable? <laughs> it's a long time. I hope I'll put one up on the on the stream. Okay. I'm sure Thomas could sort you one out, Michael, at a, a very reasonable price. Yeah. <laughs> For a man of your, uh, you know, means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nadine. For this laugh, for this laugh, Nadine, you stay big on the stream until we stop. <laughs> oh, we, must, we missed so many details from uh, Thomas when he's showing records at Dave. That would yeah, be a yeah, shame. I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> Here comes uh, Cannonball Adderley. <laughs> Thank you. 
I found here what I was looking for before because this is, um, you see, the number here is a, a 15. It's a mono release, but it has the stereo sticker on. I, this this stereo sticker I recognize and remember from the from the blue tray too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's that's this record is one that um, confused me as a collector because huh? on the label it says. Uh, BST, which is normally like the stereo, but normally it has the eight in front saying it's a stereo. But this is BST 5095, which is not normal it, for the records. True. Is it a stereo or a mono? What is it? It is a stereo. Okay. B BST, if it was a mono, stereo, BLP, BLP, BLP. BLP. But normally, if it was a stereo, it'll be 8195. Maybe our good friend, a knowledgeable OBC member, Justin Peters, has the reason. Isn't that the first stereo blue note? And that might be the reason why it's missing this number? Yeah, I think it, it is. In uh, It could be. It's, it has number... Of, it's, it's from um, 58, 1958. So that's really early for stereo. As I learned from Dave, 1958 also was when the classical starts the, the uh, stereo. There's quite all these stereo before, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. as early as 1956, but the first stereo okay. record didn't get released until 1958. But there's See? recordings from an earlier period. And it would be the okay. same. It, it, one, you know, That's the time frame on the technology. So the same applies to jazz as well. But then Blue Note has been very, very early with this one as a stereo, right? Yeah. Extremely yeah, very early. early. Very early. Yeah. yeah. Nadine, Blue Note and Soul and Disco. Can you connect the dots for us? Is that possible? I think that every or many genres have been influenced in some way or another from different other genres. Mm -hmm. So uh, disco, you have a lot of classical elements with the huge orchestra, the funk elements. Also, I, I listen a little bit about when I hear some jazz stuff. So I do think that every genre, every artist is influenced by the music he heard when he was a kid or he liked. And he made his different version out of it. But I think the roots are always there. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe Thomas can answer this question. I think hip hop. Hip hop was extremely helpful to put Blue Note back into focus and, and, and made Blue Note this favorites of the reissue label that it is now. Can, can, you, can you get a little bit deeper into this hip hop using Blue Note, Blue Donaldson comes to mind and, and other stuff? Or is that not in your really? No, I, I, it's it, there's thousands of tracks that uh, in the hip hop was made out mm -hmm. of the jazz labels, and, and especially from Blue Note and um, and also CTI made a lot of uh, uh, jazz was the mainly uh, part of hip hop in the beginning. Okay, interesting. So, so, so uh, nearly all tracks you hear about has been sampled by hip hop uh, labels. Yeah, and also Cantaloupe uh, is a famous example. I think this this came out in in the 90s mid 90s was cantaloupe which was a cover uh version by uh i forgot it but they also used the spoken intro we've heard in the beginning so if, if you guys check out youtube and uh, the song i just said check it out you will hear uh very much influence from jazz cantaloupe yeah it's good to do a little shout out to herbie hancock there because he was obviously a quite an important ar artist in terms of his base in jazz, you know, he was a jazz musician. 
but kind of transcended that scene that experimented. You know, you think you move on to the Headhunters and then into early Electro, and he was very good at doing that. But you go right back, you know, to outer records like Maiden Voyage, you know, um, yeah. and listen to that. It's great stuff. And, you know, one of the few, you know, it's really, yeah, there, you, there we go, you see. There we go. Wonderful. Yeah, Watermelon Man, Herbie Hancock taking off. And you've got Freddie Hubbard on there, Dexter Gordon. You know, it's, it, these are classics. And Herbie Hancock, you know, he's one of the few artists now. You can, I saw him last year in London, right? Yeah, you I know? remember you told us, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, you can't see these artists anymore. This era, we're at the very end of it, you know. Yeah. I'm talking, obviously, there's loads of new stuff out there, but the golden era of jazz, you can't see any of these people anymore because, they, you know, Wayne Shorter died. Yeah, there's, there's hardly any of them left. We have Ron Carter, we have Herbie Hancock. Is there fact, anybody note on Ron Carter, it's quite important, uh, Nadine. Uh, some of the jazz artists did uh, sessions on soul records, right? Yes, Just a few, exactly. There's a bit of a crossover, yeah. and a very good one to mention. Think of Gil Scott Heron, and Ron yeah. Carter played on that Gil Scott Heron, you know? Oh, okay. So, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. I, yeah, I love yeah. Robbie Hancock because of Future Shock. If you see the way he got from the jazz to like the 80s Future Shock electronic, which then was heavily sampled for hip hop exactly. because of the drum beats. And also uh, Herbie Hancock had a session with Quincy Jones where he said, oh, I want to adapt that sound for Thriller. So Herbie yeah. Hancock is an absolute legend. Yeah, very, very cool. You got to see, you know, I love, I love transcend all these styles and was very open to all the new things happening. So yeah, yeah. very cool. Music. I think one of my favorite uh, hip hop bands is uh, uh, Gangsta, and in that band you have a uh, Guru, uh, and he made a, 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 a working to, with, with some of the yeah with the with the old artists using the Jazz Matas albums, and they, exactly. they are amazing hip hop uh, jazz albums. I think. Yeah. Dave. We once did a we the once did a wonderful what was it for me personally it was a total highlight uh, and we will do it again here with also playing uh, uh, those artists. Can you somehow connect the dots to this wonderful British jazz scene you 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 teach uh, talk so much about and, and and gave us so beautiful informations? Can you are there dots how 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 are they connected when it comes to blue note? Well, I would say, yeah, so um, I'm aware, you know, you know, there's there's quite a rich history with the, the, the British jazz guys. I'm aware that, you know, sort of, uh, you know, some of our most famous uh, British jazz musician, Tubby Hayes, went over to the US and and, yeah. um, and even put a record out over there, but beforehand, just to get exposed to this, you know, totally amazing music. And, uh, and um, you know, coming back here and playing in the Soho Club, so you know the famous Roddy Scott's Club, and there are other clubs as well, like the Hundred Club and the Flamingo. Mm -hmm. And these artists get started. We were lucky that obviously London being a major city, some of the you know some of the American jazz guys were coming over to London and playing at Ronnie Scott's. And the thing mm -hmm. is, a lot of the musicians, like for example Stan Tracy, the house pianist, yeah, he, they would get the opportunity to play with these American jazz musicians over here. Yeah. And um, it's because of that reason that I think it helped that scene a lot, you know, to be able to flourish. And it was still very underground in the same way that jazz was underground in America. You know, and it, it's just, you know, you've got to think back to the 50s. 
this was an underground scene over there. It wasn't big at the time, very early. And mm -hmm. um, is is this such, like Blue Note such an important document of that whole thing? And yeah. the same here. It's a very small underground scene. They didn't earn a lot of money. You know, they did it for the love of the music, and um, they were very lucky. They got exposed to some of the best musicians. I remember they were saying, uh, I, I can't remember the exact quote. I think it was Sonny Rollins who came over, and he, he would say, he was like, "Damn, those boys can play." You know, <laughs> I think he was saying it about Stan Tracy, or, or it might have been Phil Seaman on drums. But look, I have to look it up. But you know. Yeah. It, it, but like we get the like, idea, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. You know, they were coming over, and there was exposure, and it, it, with that, it, everything's going to flourish for it. So yeah, what, that's what, where what, we, you know, what years are we talking now, Dave? What with the the? We're talking nineteen fifty. So you know, we we, okay, we that are, early. Okay, that early. You yeah. know, uh, if I think about the sort of earliest British jazz, and we get, you know, we can go back pre-vinyl onto seventy-eight, but we're talking about modernism, modern jazz. You know, we're talking nineteen fifty-one. Well. You got Charlie Parker. We're talking late, not 40, so 48, 47, 48, 49, but really happening in like 51, 52, 53. And then you've got labels like Esquire putting out very early uh, records from the Rodney Scott Jazz Club with Rodney Scott. I mean, Rodney Scott's playing is unbelievable. I love it. You know, it really gets me every time. And, um, those boys, yeah, they, they they were listening to all of this stuff, yeah. And we like fortunately, you know, records were coming over, imports were coming in. So it was and but it, it was small, it was all centered around central London. You know, we've got the famous uh Dobell's jazz shop and on Charing Cross. Yeah. Um, which you know, without these sort of independent shops, it probably wouldn't have happened, you know. See, and now happened what I hoped for. Those two minutes made us so eager to do this British jazz. When we, <laughs> when I see you in jazz now, I can, I know how amazing this will be yeah, we're gonna when, do we, nice. when we will cover this music. <laughs> We've got to do a British jazz. Uh, we will for sure. Yeah, we will, we will do for sure. We will do for sure. Thomas, another tune prepared? Always. Oh, cool. <laughs> And Stella mentions Michael Garrick, one of the, the best British jazz artists as well. So I love it when these names get mentioned here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Garrick, yeah. very, very cool. And very rare, very hard to find. Like the Argo records now, even over here, you just never, never see them. Yeah, you have to show all those wonderful records again. I know you have quite some amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thomas, Blue Note. So that means that from the very first days of you being a record collector, you grabbed all the Blue Notes you were able to find? Yeah, I, I think I, I grabbed the one that was most well known at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. are. And then, uh, then I suddenly started to find out, oh, what are the numbers? And mm -hmm. they have such a number system so you you can easily find out which one is the oldest one and you can mm -hmm. you can try to follow uh, mostly when i collect i try to go which one was the first release yeah when i like two or three records i go back what was the first release and i try to learn what it's about and then uh, at some point i find okay this is what i like about blue note and then mm -hmm. it might come down to like 30 records that i really love and a hundred that i really like and uh and so another two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, so when it comes to Blue Note nowadays, and 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 due to those reissue labels, Music Messers Jazz, Analog Production put out fifty titles. We have the Tone Poet series. We have the classic record series from Do Not. Meaning, I think I alone have around 350 reissues of, of Blue Note. So this is, of course, a huge number and shows us how popular until today this, this, this jazz label is. But nowadays, when I, when I see the reactions on my channel, when I talk to other uh, 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 YouTube content creators, the most titles that makes people really, really exciting is stuff like Eric Dorfee, uh, 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 Bobby Hutchison, uh, Gretchen Mancour the third, the ones that are really not the to total typical Blue Note ones, right? You know what I mean? The ones that are a little more out there are nowadays the most popular ones. I see Dave seems to agree. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would sort, I would agree, Michael, that there does, you know, the whole free jazz, uh, well, not just free, but just maybe a yeah. bit later, a little, it, it's a bit, you know, it's not so much of the, I don't think you would class that, that's not hard bot, yeah, the early stuff. Um, is it, it is more experimental? I would think is a good word to use. Or more out there. I I always say it's more out there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, well, there, there's a famous Eric Dolphy album called Out There. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But it's yeah. on prestige. So, you know, so prestige. it's probably a good a good uh, good word to use to describe it. But I would say that it's quite. I would say trendy. Yeah. That's all. The stuff is quite trendy um, at the moment uh, for people. So, oh, let yeah. me let me give me the chance uh, to get into Hey Joe's comment. Uh, 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 um, yeah, I miss those two, but for me, it was not appropriate anymore to do those videos just showing the records, reading what's on the jacket, and giving you my impression only about the reissue. So I waited a little bit, and now thanks to the connections now I have in the OVC, I will be able to do the Tone Poet releases the way I like them to do, meaning I can compare them to an original. So I will do Tone Poet videos again, but only, but it will be possible in the in the most cases when I have the original at hand, so that I have again a scale where I can compare it to. I think that is very important when it comes to, to these kinds of videos. You know, I, I, I figured that out. I saw it when I did the Sam uh, Records video with the Shah, Shiab Shahib. And having this original was, was, was really important for this video. So that's for this part. Sorry, I hope I didn't interrupt. <laughs> I think that's a good way to do that, Michael, so people get can get a real impression about how did the original sound compare exactly. to, to the originals to get a good comprehension instead of saying, okay, I have here the tone poet, it sounds great, thank you, good night. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, uh, um, everybody says, uh, uh, me included, oh, those reissues, they are fantastic, they are fantastic, probably better than the original. Who knows? I want to know. I want to know now. And now, as I have the opportunity, thanks to these two guys, <laughs> I of course, I of course, will do this. You know, that makes sense to me. Thomas, what are your favorite uh, blue notes? Is it also these these titles that are a little more out there, or uh, uh, um, are you a classic guy and says, no, 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 Michael? I like my blue train. I like my grand green. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I, I don't think I have a, a favorite. For me, Blue Note is like a, a area of music and it's mm -hmm. kind of music that I really like. And of course, there's some that I listen to, but it's not like I have one favorite. I might have 30 favorites. Yeah. But I like, I like it when it's a little bit out there. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, but but Justin, again, 
thanks to Thomas in this case, I also had the briefly into the sharp ship. Um, I also had the 2001 reissue from Japan. And this is not that expensive, but that was fantastic too. So if you really like the record and don't want to spend a really big amount of money, if you get lucky and find one, try this Japanese reissue. Amazing. Sorry. Sorry, a little off topic. Oh, well, I, I think... <laughs> uh, I, I think I like it. I like the artwork. Mm -hmm. I like the idea. I like the history about it. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I, I like with the label. And uh, I don't. We didn't talk that much about the uh, the cover artwork, which uh, no. uh, uh, Francis Wolf, one of the starters, uh, he made the pictures himself. So he went into the studio from day one when they recorded the records and st starting taking pictures. So they did the pictures themselves, and then uh, the, the, it became a, a style of the, the records. And, then, and I like. And then, um, I was going to say, Thomas. Well, then, in combination with Reed Miles, who who came from a Squire magazine, is the use of the uh, the type the typography, yeah, the typography, the use of uh, characters, yeah, and the design of those was some of the most the strongest that's ever been done. You know, and that's why these covers are so re revered now as pieces of art, because it was that this sort of perfect synergy you had of the photography with amazing typography and layout and design and color, which just made, makes them so special. And yeah. a, a lot of the times the pictures were this big and, and uh, Reed Miles choose like small part of the, the pictures. And, and put it out as a label. He was really good at seeing uh, and, and making a style that could last for a long time with those. Like, yeah, we have so many so iconic Blue Note cover art. I mean, etc. The the cool strutting. Yeah, this it, the portrait portraits exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in the beginning, it was lot, a lot of the artists with the with the with the the faces on it, mm -hmm. while while it become uh, less and less and then then he went into like more typography with the, yeah typography the like that's a yeah. classic classic yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 exactly oh Herb Hancock there was not yeah. and there was not no artist on it. I'm one of my favorite favorite blue notes by the way Imperial one of my uh, favorite uh, covers is this one yeah fantastic yeah yeah true but you can see they look a little bit the same from yeah. the art to another mm -hmm. this is an amazing yeah you know i just want to say it's also fantastic yeah mm. yeah classic soul samba brilliant can we can we hear something from it thomas from the soul samba yeah we like quebec yeah here we have the cool strutting of course yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think it's a uh, first that's what you have to uh, remortgage your house for that one. <laughs> How much is this, Dave? This cool strutting <laughs> to be as much as you want it to be, Nadine. <laughs> uh, that's like with everything in life. Yeah, that's Nadine. You, you know, I think it's good. <laughs> condition is the key, also with the price. If you have a really that one's one that's like. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what are we talking about? Five thousand, seven thousand. Yeah, I mean, look, you, it's, no, but, you know, you, you're going to be looking at five thousand. For a really clean, but it has to be a really clean one, right? Right there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, uh, it's it's just one of those records. It, it's very iconic that one for the cover as well. It's mm. one of the most iconic covers for the the Blue Note series. Um, yeah. and, uh, uh, for me, it's a good example of um, this one of a record that uh, I'm jumping up because uh, I had one like this earlier, another copy. But you are not showing all OGs, right? I only have one OG, but ah, okay, only one. Okay. Yeah, you went up, you went up the list and get a more, more uh, rare one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. <coughs> Again, with Blue Note, you are quite serious, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I think Thomas is with every genre quite serious from what I've seen so far. I love it. I like all kinds of music. 
Iya. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like Quebec because it's got a really laid back style. But there are quite some, some records when it comes to Blue Note that have a heavy, heavy Latin influence, right? You don't have that with the British jazz, or, or, or you don't have that on Prestige either, if I, or, or am I wrong here, Dave? You might have one or two on the British side using sort of those Latin style beats, a bit of a sort of Bossa Nova style. Yeah. Um, but, but no, I mean, I think maybe Blue Note, there's some more where it's kind of, dev, you know, like we were listening to that Sabu record, Sabu Martinez. Yeah. It's very specific that record. And I think maybe Blue Note, there, there are those sort of types of Bossa Nova beats that you'll hear on like, a few of the records. But there's one or two on the British jazz as well that you'll hear. Um, it's just, you know, it's like a style, like a style that they obviously uh obviously appreciate it works well in the clubs right right that's true nadine apropos clubs uh, um so is it safe to say when i ask you that you probably are into these latin titles when it comes to blue note or do you also see the point and and you like uh, 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 eric Dolphy? I love cool jazz. I love what Miles Davis did in Kind of Blue. That's totally down my alley. Mm -hmm. I like also the, the Latin flavor to it. But this is like music when I remember when I was a child and you were in the elevator. That's yeah. exactly okay. the kind of music yeah, yeah. you play. Yeah. 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 So you are saying that for you, Blue Note is elevator music. <laughs> no, I'm not <laughs> saying that. You asked me about my opinions yes, about I, the Latin. I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, I, like I said, I love cool okay, okay. I, oh, Wait, I get you back. I'm fumbling here. I just was kidding. You never said Blue Note is elevator music. That Michael, we me. already know you so well. That, that you're me person, putting words into your mouth. <laughs> 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 okay. So... I think it's really well played uh, elevator music, and that's why I, that little bit what I call call dad jazz. Like it's it's a it's a little bit too beautiful, but yeah. but, but mm -hmm. I'll say the Latin records I, I love them all. For me, they're not elevator music; they're really cool. But but now again, I remember the the British jazz video I I did with Dave, and and it was almost was tragical, and he mentioned this too a little bit. When you see how how those guys love their music, they but they didn't make a serious buck with it. They all had this drug addictions, and and they were always on the brink of financial breakdown. How how was it with Blue Note, the label, and the musicians, Dave? Similar or or did they? Okay, Miles Davis, we don't need to discuss. But but I think how, you'll find it was a very similar situation. Yeah. Apart from, you know, the ones that, you know, unless you were huge, mm. so we're talking your Miles Davis or other ones that made it through, like, you know, uh, Dave Brubeck, Take Five, yeah, the stuff that broke through. Yeah, yeah or maybe even even uh, uh, one of the most successful, you you mentioned him, the guy with the, with the organ, uh, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy Smith. Smith. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, it, I can't put numbers on things, but... I would say I would say that uh, unfortunately a lot of the artists would have not been in the leagues of the one you know that were doing it you know that, that would have yeah to have the success they, they they wouldn't have had a an extravagant lifestyle. So there is no Taylor Swift among them. I, I think that's safe to say, right? These were different times, weren't they? You know, yes. and it was and and the, and the label itself, Dave. And the thing is, I don't think it was you know. A lot of the this real sort of hard bop, the real sort of uh, purist jazz, wasn't for the masses. You know, it's okay. only later now that we look back and we see all these amazing records and the beautiful cover artwork and 
the history and everything that they've become revered. But uh, you know, at the time, I you know people, you know, it's like a lot of things you don't realize what you got at the time. Okay, so we are talking avant-garde at that time. It was under, yeah, it was independent. It was underground. I suppose it was the underground music at the time. You know, we, we are talking war. Yeah, we are, probably, we are talking war here. Early yeah, probably it was like it was like the devil's music, like rock and roll when it first happened. <laughs> jazz was, there's a time when jazz was seen, you know, as the devil's work. Yeah, <laughs> not this, yeah, this yeah, 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 thing, but that was a bit earlier. But you know what? You know, it was an underground. It's you know, you think of these clubs and just playing, and that's why they were doing sessions and playing all night long. And you know, a lot of them had issues with uh, drugs and heroin. You know, and um. That's why it's great to watch the, watch the Lee Morgan documentary because that will give you a really good picture. Exactly, yeah. That's why I, I, I love this topic so much. And what Sean from, from the wonderful uh, uh, YouTube channel, The Vinyl Dreamscape, says here, a lot of criticism with a wide religious community. And exactly. here in Germany, is the same. I think all over the world it was... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. True. Exactly. True. But I think if you have a schedule like this, being recording in the daytime being on stage in the nighttime uh, i think slipping into the drug abuse is a very easy way to get an escape from all the stress uh, money pressure uh, getting contracts and and all of this so uh, it, and also it wasn't like, just the smaller artists you know miles davis yeah hank, hank mobley is legendary for it you yeah. know they all battled with this and i i just yeah. think it comes with the uh, you know, being a sort of, you know, genius creatives like this. Yeah, but, but some says, Dave, some says it, that it comes from the from the uh, godfather of them, Charlie Parker. The, some say it's all about Charlie Parker. He put them all into this. As if it belongs to being a, a, a jazz musician, you have to be a drug addict. Even 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 uh, the British, you, talk, you, 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 you talked about it, you told oh, us. Oh, yeah, they were, they were, they, we, we. A lot of them were. Yeah, yeah. They all battled, you know, like Tubby Hayes is uh, legendary for it. Yeah. You know, there's some really good people over here that document his stuff. There's a great, I'll mention his name actually, Simon Spillett. He's, a, he's one of our leading saxophonists at the moment to do with Tubby Hayes. And he does gigs over here and at Ronnie Scott's sort of re, re you know, taking this music and bringing it to a new audience, you know, so. There's a few. There's a big. In fact, I noticed um, a hater in the um, in the comments mentioned that there is a there's a whole new jazz scene uh, that's been happening recently, and young yeah. people finding this. There's some great musicians out there. So it's not gone away. You know, we're looking back at the history of it, and it's a really rich and beautiful history. But we've got to look at the the future of it as well and where it goes. So and it's happening. Thomas. I would say nobody captured the music that uh, that Blue Note did in 1951. Uh, I think uh, Commodore is another label that put out this kind of music, but nobody knew about this music at that time. So it was it was a new thing for everybody. You didn't have a chance to listen to it if you were not at the live scenes. So so this was the first time, and then it was really uh, different from anything else. And then um, uh, with Miles Davis, what I heard. While they got uh, Miles Davis to do some of the records, it was only because uh, all the other labels were so tired of him and his drugs. Mm. So th they got the chance to work with him uh, uh, in the beginning while he was mostly down. But it, mm. it, they became some good records out of it. That's for sure. That's for sure. Even if you see when you see the documentary and they explain why uh, uh, Lee Morgan all of a sudden had a new haircut. It was because while he was under drug influences, he slept at the radiator and got a huge scar here on the forehead. And then he changed his hair so that you don't see the scar <laughs> where he burnt himself. <laughs> Apropos drugs, Dave, are you drinking any beer tonight? Yeah, no, I've got, as always, you know, I, Ah, okay, coffee. your favorite one, the Dijon. Yeah, if yeah, we're yeah. doing a jazz session, it would be... Oh. Uh, I, I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> Salud. Nadine? Sacolada iced tea, as you do. Thank you. 
This record is one that most uh, people. We didn't hear you. I think this one is in top five of the best Blue Note records. If you ask all around, which one okay, okay. This is one of the ones that made it as well. That song for my father. Yeah, this, one, this is yeah. the song. Yeah, this is the song. Yeah. Song for my father. We listened to. Yeah, it's one of those ones that that, that sort of rose above. Yeah. Yeah, this one, this one also is one of those that ate really, really well in my opinion. So you can listen to this record any day. I think it's wonderful. I think it has a little bit. Uh, it's it's one of those who sound like beauty, but it has some really good elements to it. It surprises yeah. you, yeah. and it sounds so well. I love uh, Hey Joe's question from us because I love this record. Do you have Evolution or some other stuff by uh, Gresham and Kurt? Uh, Ink Jacket. Is it, um, uh, 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 Joe, we need Joe, please give us the number, please. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a Blue Note record. Uh, 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 Gresham and Evolution is a Blue Note record. I'm quite sure. And I, I, I'm sure Hey Joe will find the number. Find the number. Yeah. Oh, let me down, Joe. I agree. I agree with you, Prime. He said that you, even through the stream, you get an idea. Of that, of that original. Yeah. Here you have the number. Of Forty-one fifty-three. <laughs> <laughs> saw the number but it was not in the it was not in the right position so i need to look for the picture as well Yes, you're right, Jefferson. A uh, music letter says put out uh, 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 one of my favorite from music matters jazz. Yeah. But Dave, you know uh, what record we are talking about when it comes to Gresham and Kur the third. Yeah, I know the one with the pink. I know it. Evolution with the pink uh, cover and the uh, dots on. Uh, yeah. yeah, he did some. He did a. I, I, it's not many blue notes. I've, I've got one or two yeah. of them actually. Yeah. Another one yeah, with the gray and blue cover. And and also this this Vahu. What is the artist's name? Vahu is the title of the record. Um, 
Also, I think he only did this one blue note, and this became a real popular blue note. Title is The Who. Oh, Thomas is back. Maybe we got no. lucky now. No? No, we got no. I don't have it here. So. Okay, no problem. No problem. So you have the good stuff you have at home, right? Yeah, but I, I try to bring the good stuff here today, but. Uh, yeah, it's not possible. It's not possible. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I remember that one I played with this one because they look. Thank you, Dave. Duke Pearson. Oh, oh, oh! Show, show that again. That looks amazing. Charlie Ralph. Yeah. I don't yeah, know that. Can you please play it? I don't know that at all. It's not one of the best ones, but it has a nice cover. It has for sure. See, that is why, because I'm only curated through those reissues. And if I'm not mistaken, this hasn't been reissued, uh, at least not at one of those big labels, and so I don't know it. No, I, I think that's... that's Most people who are into the jazz nowadays, they, they start uh, buying the reissues. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I don't agree all the time what they put out because i think mm -hmm. they, they put out i think they need to have a contract to put out uh, so if they don't have an agreement of course they can't put out but but some of the best never been reissued but this doesn't but, go for blue note uh, 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 thomas blue note can put out what they want to pull out so yeah 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 they can but mostly they put out what was a big hit at that time mm -hmm. Yeah. And they think, okay, yeah. we can sell right. a lot of those That's again. They don't, they don't uh, take those. Uh, oh, I more think I'm freezing. Yeah. Dave, might that also have to do something with tape condition? And what do you, I know sometimes you are very close to these things for whatever reason. What do you know about tape condition, tape degradation when it comes to Blue Note? I wouldn't know about Blue Notes because obviously they're. I can't talk about Blue Note specifically because mm -hmm. I've never seen the original Blue Note tape, but mm -hmm. I'm sure they've been extremely well looked after. And knowing about maybe some other tapes and and that I've mm -hmm. seen, you know, the thing is, a lot of these labels they did very much look after their mm -hmm. original master tapes. And um, you know, people talk about tape degrading over time, but I've seen examples of very early master tapes. You know, going right back. To the early yeah. 50s yeah. um and they they've been in perfectly good condition for using and getting remarkable results from so i would think with the blue notes uh i, I believe it they're all owned by universal um that they're, they're going to be super and i i think you know if you took an original mouse tape for that and cut it now you'll get fantastic results on the right equipment you know so okay. Uh, but there are, by the way, you know, it's, it's not the case for everything. I'll, I'll tell you the interesting story. There's like a sort of, you know, I'll talk about the British jazz. There's a, there's a rumor, all the original Tempo records, which is one of the yeah. biggest, most collectible uh, British jazz labels, mm -hmm. uh, put out some great records. And um, the, the, apparently all those tapes have disappeared or they, they, were, they were lost. Yeah. So who knows? There's always stuff like that that goes on. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe... You know, if you got down into the nitty gritty or had access to, maybe mm. it, it's the same with some blue notes. You know, maybe there there aren't they aren't all there now, and that could be. So that might be the reasons why they don't put out the records where Thomas would yeah, say, "Oh, put that out, yeah. run or something." Yeah. 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 This is purely speculation, but there could be other reasons. You know, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, like Thomas mentioned, they'll pick particular releases to put out because they were big and well known. But it would be nice to see some, um, you know. And they see some some sort of more off piece titles being put out yeah. as well. You know, obviously yeah. there's a lot of people out there. <laughs> Liam. <laughs> so yeah, Kenny. <laughs> so you know, there, this whole trad jazz scene, and you know, Kenny. <laughs> Liam has Liam loves his jazz, doesn't he? He does. He does for sure. <laughs> Stranger on the shore. That's it. I think that was recorded by Columbia Lansdowne. We had a good studio here. Columbia had Lansdowne. They put out things like Don Rendell. Or they did some great British jazz records. Joe Harriet. Uh, that, that's all Stan Tracy. And they were recorded. But they also did a lot of the sort of, what I would say, mainstream stuff. So, yeah. 
<laughs> I like that. Let's stunty stunty's compensating for us. <laughs> okay. Hey Joe makes another uh, 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 recommendation. Maybe we are lucky with the four thousand two hundred and five. Oh, oh, the Basra. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that was fast. Yeah, the Basra, of course. Pete La Roca. I agree. Other one is different, different, uh, 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 are those different uh, 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 issue uh, uh, reissues or, or this one is, uh, this one is original okay is, okay you see how they change the color to make it more beautiful but I think I'm <laughs> not yet I guess <laughs> But, but he's probably on the list, though. He's on the list. This is an amazing record. Wow. Good suggestion. Thank you. Although, yeah, exactly. Uh, 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 Jay Joe said it, but you were already on it, right? <laughs> or edit. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was Elon Musk's Neuralink, I believe, between Hey yeah, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was our first take um, on, 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 on the Blue Note label. And if I might say, it was one of the most interesting streams about Blue Note I have ever seen. I've learned. No, you haven't again seen so it. Much. You were part of it, and you were important. Part yes, of it. but I was also a little sitting back and letting the knowledgeable people uh, explain uh, what all the differences and uh, Dave and Thomas' amazing, yeah. amazing work. Great. Again, Dave, thanks a lot. Of course, I. Covering Blue Note, I mean, what a what, what a great subject, you know. Yeah. What an important yeah. subject. And, and and from there we can move on, right? And and now we have covered Blue Note, and now we can go move on and, and, and yeah, take Blue Note. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thomas, thank you so much. I You're hope welcome. I hope you enjoyed this one too. And uh, as I said at the beginning, you will find already quite some blue notes, although I can tell you some are gone already, but there will be more. We will put on blue note records continuously on the OBC shop at the OBC shop, if you're interested. And I was quite surprised that a lot of them are not as pricey as I feared they are. So we will listen now again to some music. And then we will fade out into the night. <laughs> into the night. Uh, yeah, because, uh, I think we uh, we only touched a corner of it, even though we spoke about it. Of course, and we will go back into it. And next week we will have a similar yet totally different uh, uh, topic. Yeah, we will do this now on a weekly basis. I think. We have quite a commu found a community here. Because what, what could be interesting is to go into stuff like this 
Yeah. Of course. More recently, good. though, it's looking at the, the yeah. more modern. That's my you want, Okay, we can make an. Uh, 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 we can go on and go into recent stuff. Although I'm, I'm out there because I don't know much about it. If you wanna, if you wanna share, uh, 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 some of I those. Think it, I think it could be a, a, a stream by itself. Okay, then let's do it this way. So then let's 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 listen to one last song and and then we fade out. And and this one will be like in between, like the old stuff we listen to, and the, the new stuff, which is uh, okay. two thousand. Uh, 2021, which already collectible like 500 euro records. So that it's good to still uh, keep in contact and listen to new stuff from uh, Blue Note because they're, they're really good stuff putting out. But we'll, we'll uh, finish in 1975 with some a little bit in the middle when uh, Liberty yes. uh, owned the record. Thank you, Frank. Sasha, thank you. And now, Dave, come on, do the same. Come on, give it. <laughs> yeah, Dave. <laughs> it's a little to the change in style, right? Yeah. What I'm moving forward, they 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 moved on. 